life's a journey, isn't it? And life, I realize, is very fragile. And for most of us, we can feel like that because on the days where everything's going great, we think, oh, thank you, Jesus. But then on the days where it's all over the place, we really feel wobbly, don't we? And we feel uncertain and we start to lose that sense of who's in control. But when we stop, when we take a breath, when we think for a minute, we know that we have six words that anchor us, six words that keep us where we need to be, six words that stop us from falling. And do you know what those six words are? In him, all things hold together. In him, all things hold together. Because life out there is crazy for most people. And everyone is looking for answers for things. People feel like they're drifting. It feels chaotic. At times, people feel completely overwhelmed by the circumstances. Do you know what? Most people in the world are spinning so many plates. They're juggling so many balls. They're trying to be so many things. They're trying to be a good parent. They're trying to be a good employee. They're trying to be that caring daughter, that good husband. And the list of demands goes on and on and on. And for some people, their lives literally feel like they're falling apart. Relationships can be in pieces. Their health, just difficulties. And they've been robbed of enjoying life. Maybe the finances have become a burden that they can't bear. And people have lost a sense of order and a sense of purpose, and a sense that there is a plan. And yet in the Word, it's really clear. There is one, and there always will be. And we have that answer. We have that answer. Because in Colossians, it says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities were created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. Isn't that amazing? It all began with Jesus. This whole thing that we live in today, everything that we see all began in Jesus. Everything we do, it's for Jesus. And everything's going to find its meaning and its purpose in him. And wherever we see breakdown, wherever we see chaos in the world, it's because people are operating outside of the parameters that God made for them outside of the guidance that they were created for. And I think so many people are going through life without the blueprint of what it's supposed to be and how it's supposed to work. You know the way some people would be like technically challenged. I think Ben and Andrew would put me in this category. When it comes to technology, wouldn't really know that much about it. And you know the way sometimes you feel better about yourself when you compare yourself with other people who are like lower down the scale. So I know I'm not great when it comes to technology. But then every time my dad gets a new phone, within like two weeks, he's back to the shop to tell him it's not working. Because do you know what this last problem was? It didn't, he wasn't getting any calls. I'm not getting any calls. I don't know. I keep getting that thing, but I've get, like, it tells me I've missed a call, but I'm just not getting it. He didn't have the volume up. It's just like Ben went, Granddad, there's this little button here, and if you just press it, you see all these little bars go up, and that's called the volume. And then look, and then he's like, oh, brilliant, brilliant. Well, then there was somebody else in this church. I'm not going to say who it was because I wouldn't want to embarrass them, but it was a relative, and I thought this one was brilliant. This was they were trying to get the EasyJet app downloaded onto their phone. And so they'd gone onto the website, and it was saying, hit this to download. So they kept clicking and had the phone sitting here, and they were on the computer. They were hitting. And 17 tabs later, we're going, it's not working. I've hit this 17 times. It's still not on my phone. So that wasn't me. That wasn't me. Somebody that we know, but it wasn't me. So then I feel a bit better. But I realize that there's all these, like, you know, they have all these books, like IT for dummies. I would need that book. I know that I need that book. But I was thinking, do you know what? There are people in life, there's a lot of people who are spiritual dummies. They've just disregarded faith. They've just see that it's not, they think that it's not important. But most of them can't answer the very, very basic questions of life the one thing that all of us need to face at one time, is this life all there is? Is this all there is? And yet we know we have the word as our anchor because it says, again, in Colossians, I found these verses so encouraging. He is before all things and in him all things hold together and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. 
Jesus has the answer. He's already given us the answers. And the one thing we all have in common is that one day we'll pass from this life. But Jesus has already walked that journey. He understands everything because he's, he's walked through death. He's walked through darkness. He's experienced rejection. He's experienced the darkest place of the human heart when he took on our sin. He knows how fragile life can be, but he understands it. And he has the answer. He's made a way for us to live free. And what's the one thing everyone around us is searching for? What's the one thing that we all need? It's peace, isn't it? Everyone is looking for peace and everyone knows that money can't buy it. But it says again in Colossians, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. He's made peace. And we allow his peace to flow through us when we rest in that perfect place of safety. He's created all things all things. He holds them all together. He is the head and we're the body, the church. So we find our place of safety, of security, of protection, of provision and rest when we're connected, when we anchor our lives in his church. This is where he calls us to be because this is where we're safe. This is where we're provided for. This is where we find peace and where we find rest. Many of us wobble, don't we? We lose our peace. Why do we lose our peace? What happens? Dog runs away. I lost my peace on Thursday morning. I was, ah, what are we doing? It's often not the events that make us wobble, but it's, we fear the repercussions. So if we lose our jobs, is it that we fear that, is it just the income that we fear or is there shame? Is there condemnation? What did I do wrong? If we have a relational breakdown, again, Satan gets us with the shame of it, doesn't he? What did you do? The the accusing, the pointing the finger. But how does God see us? What does he say about us forever, no matter what's going on? It says, for you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. Holy, blameless, and above reproach is how Jesus sees you now. It's how he saw you yesterday. It's how he'll see you forever. Holy, blameless, above reproach. But we're surrounded by people whose lives are fragile, who are living away from God. And when we wobble, we know we've got the answer. We know we've got the anchor. We know where to go back to. But we've people all around us who don't know that. But you know what? Often people are closer than you think to Jesus. If we've been looking through test- stories in the New Testament, there's a story I wanted to look at this morning. And it's one of those stories that, do you know what? You kind of feel as soon as you're going to say it, everyone's going to switch off because it's like you've done it so many times in Sunday school. You've sung the songs about it. You've done the crafts about it. You know, you've done everything you can. So you kind of think, oh, how do you, how do you bring anything new about this? Anyone guess what it is? It's one with the little man. Does not want to sing the songs? Zacchaeus, yes. Okay. But we're going to look at Luke 19, and hopefully I'm going to bring some things out of it that you don't know. So it says in Luke 19, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So it says he was a chief tax collector. Do you know that's the only time that's used? Chief tax collector. So it was, I mean, tax collectors were important. He was super important. But it says he was rich. Now, do you know the only way tax collectors got rich? 
Anyone guess? Because they stole. Yeah, if you were rich, it's because you weren't doing your pro- job properly. You were taking more than you should have done. So you probably weren't very popular, but you know what the interesting thing was about his name? Zacchaeus actually means pure one. So every time you called him, you had to say, Zacchaeus, you were calling out pure one. Now, can you imagine how annoying that would be? Imagine like going up and saying, oh, here you go, Mr. Honest. Here's your taxes. It'd be really, really irritating. Imagine having that kind of name. It's kind of like having a name like Too Good, isn't it? It's a bit annoying. <laughs> but... It would be really annoying to have to say that when you knew that he was living the opposite of it. You'd want to call him Mr. Unpopular or Mr. Cheat, wouldn't you? And you can imagine what people would have said behind his back. And then there's the fact that he was small. Now, we all think about this and then we all go, yeah, he was small, so we had to climb the tree. Like, why did they even need to put that he was small? I don't know. I'm just speculating. But maybe that was something that he carried all his life in terms of maybe he'd been persecuted or he'd been got out for being small. Maybe that's why he wanted to get people back and take money off them. Because actually, he'd always been the one that everyone looked down on. And he was finding a way to get his own back. Do you know what? We don't know the backstory. But I felt like Jesus saying to me this week, do you know what? With most people, you don't know the backstory. And we look at their outward behavior and we make judgments on it. But Jesus is the only one who knows the heart. Jesus is the only one who knows the journey. And who knows why we've become the people we are. And his love is so much greater. And look... Now, Zacchaeus ran ahead. Now, we can just kind of think, oh, well, sure, he had to because he wanted to get in front of the rest of them. But that was, I mean, how many of you as adults often run places? I do when I'm trying to pick up my kids because I've left it too late and I'm panicking that I'm going to be in trouble with the teachers. But in general, many of us, how many of you ran to church this morning? (laughs) It's not really the thing that we do. And particularly if you're an important person, you wouldn't be seen running. So what does that tell us? about Zacchaeus? What does that tell us about what was going on in his heart? What does that tell us about his hunger? Jesus, there was something about Jesus that he didn't want to miss and he made sure he got there. And then, like, hands up, who's climbed a tree this week? Anybody? Actually, yeah, we were cutting down trees yesterday. Jillian, was that Jillian? No, oh, John, you've been climbing trees. Good for you. Not many people, not many of us in our adult life climb trees. We might do it with a bit of fun with our kids, but it's not the kind of thing you do. And you definitely don't want to be seen folding out of a tree. But what what amazes me here is the chaos actually didn't care what anyone thought. He didn't care that he ran ahead. He didn't care that he climbed the tree and might have looked stupid. And then how does Jesus respond to him when he meets him? The amazing thing was he called him by name. And Zacchaeus might have been used to people saying his name. He might have been used to people saying his name in a certain way. Maybe not that kindly. And I thought for a minute, it probably would have been amazing at first was the case. It probably wouldn't surprise. I would have thought like, oh, he knows me. And then he would have thought, he knows me. And then he would have thought, he knows me. Because there would have been the, the sense of, oh, somebody's bothered enough to know my name. And then the sense of, Fear of, oh, but if he knows my name, does he know all about me? But then the sense of peace that, but he knows all about me and he's still here. How many people in your world today need to hear that Jesus knows their name? That he knows them? That he knows them? And that he knows them? See, it says in John 10, 3, he calls his own sheep by name. Jesus wants people to know that he loves them intimately. He will meet them wherever they're at. He will come to them and search them out. Even if they think they can peer from afar, he will draw right up to them and call them by name. I was talking to someone recently and they were saying, I mean, they used to live very far from God in the world's estimations. And yet, do you know what? All it took one day was for one person to say, do you want to come to church? And they went, yes. And I would guess that most people would have written this person off. Most people would have looked at their lifestyle, at the things that they were into, and would have made the judgment that they are so far away from the Lord. There is no chance you'd ever get them in church. But it took one person to say, do you want to come to church? And that has made, that person became a Christian. Their wife became a Christian. They're now praying for their family. And they are seeing change in their complete lives and into the 
their family, into their community, because one person said, would you like to come to church? Jesus says, it's Christ in you. It says in Colossians, sorry, Christ in you, the hope of glory. If we read it in Colossians 1, 28. To them, God made, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. With Zacchaeus, we saw how one person living outside of God's ways was impacting a whole community because he was stealing from them. And when Jesus stepped in and that one person changed, what did Zacchaeus do? Did he just pay back? He made an overpayment four times more. He wasn't told to. He wasn't corrected. He wasn't obliged to. It came from the overflow of what Jesus had done in his heart. Isn't it incredible? Isn't it incredible? That's the hope of glory. I was reading a book recently that talked about an incident in a prison of war camp in the Second World War. And I'm just going to try and read it from this. It said the Allied soldiers were behaving like barbarians. This was in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. They were stealing from each other. From their rob- they were robbing from dying colleagues. They were fighting for scraps of food. Sure. The law of the jungle had become the law of the camp. Death by disease triumphs life. And it said, but then something wonderful happened. Two new prisoners in whom hope still stirred were transferred to the camp. Although they were sick and frail, they held a higher code. They shared their meager meals and they volunteered for extra work. They cleansed people's sores, massaged their legs. They gave, the first, they gave a man his first bath in six weeks and this man, um, slowly his strength returned and then his dignity. And then it says their goodness proved contagious and the man Ernest, he contracted the case. He became like them. He began to treat the other sick people, share his rations. He even gave away a few of his belongings and other soldiers did likewise. And over time, the tone of the camp softened and brightened. The sacrifice replaced the selfishness. The soldiers began to hold worship services and Bible studies. Isn't that incredible? These men had gone from living like animals to remembering who they truly were. Contagious love came in. Isn't that incredible? They were the hope of glory in that place. And that man survived to tell the tale. And many others did because of that. Let's get a revelation again of who Jesus is and what he means to this world around us. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. How many people outside need the light of life? This is what we possess. So we can spur each other on to the hope of glory that's in us in this fragile world where people are searching for answers and life is unraveling around them. We all know these verses We've heard them loads of times. Matthew 5, 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And most of the time when I read these words, do you know what I've focused on in the past? They may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. I need to do more good deeds and then people will see my light. And I felt like God was saying, you're not reading that right. Because many people are running around and doing good deeds, but nobody's noticing them and nobody's accrediting them, to, accrediting them to me. So whose light is it that's supposed to shine? It's Jesus in us. It's not about us. It's not our good works. The light in you is Jesus. When he shines, then your good works are illuminated and brought to life. It's not about doing lots of things so that light will come out of them. And oh, look at all these good things I've done. People are going to notice this now and think it's Jesus. It's no, actually, Jesus shines in you. And then as a byproduct of that, you will, you will want to do good things. And that light, that he is going to illuminate those things. It's not about us trying to do lots of things. It's actually focusing on his light in us. Our light doesn't shine by doing good stuff. It shines by drawing closer to the source, who's Jesus And as we receive him, his light will shine in us. And that's what people are going to be drawn to. And that's why I feel so excited about our mission as a church. We have a contagious love. We have a contagious love. 
like the guy in the prisoner of war camp, we're no different. When we feed on the source, when we feed on his light, it's not just about this, our little individual lights. Jesus has called us as a body. It's not about us just trying to do our little bit over here and somebody else trying to do their little bit over here. We're called as a body. Doesn't it say in Matthew 14, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. That's what we're called for. The light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. This is what we're called for, a place that people are drawn to, a place of safety, a place of refuge, a place of love and encouragement, a place of healing, a place of restoration, a place of hope, and a place of purpose. This is the body of Christ. This is who we are. So what is it they're going to see? What is this contagious love going to look like when people come into this place? It says in John 13, 33, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Does anyone remember what Jesus had just done when he said that? Wash the feet. So Andrew's just going to go, we've got a whole pile of bowls. Just to, can you just go and get them? Yeah. <laughs> if you just take your shoes off, Ben has volunteered because he likes to do this. He's going to come around and wash everyone's feet. Okay, Ben, isn't that right? Brilliant. So this is going to be great. We're just getting back to what it was like in those days, what it was like at that time. So anyone got really mucky feet? Ben really loves mucky feet, don't you, Ben? But that's what, that's what Jesus was talking about. He did the lowliest thing to show people what love looked look like. He became the servant to show people what love looked like. And do you know what? Over the years, servant in church has almost got like this kind of bad name, hasn't it? It's almost like one of those words, you know, like tithing and things in the Christian life because it's almost been twisted. And there has been times where it's been abused in the church and people have been made to feel like condemned if they're not doing things. And, oh, you know, you must serve, you must do this, you must do that. So a lot of us have, you know, have reacted to it. And particularly, I think, in the Grace Church, we can kind of go, oh, we're not under any condemnation. Nobody can tell me what to do. But you know what? Actually, God has ordained for us to serve because it brings us freedom, because we get over ourselves. If we want to find life, we lay it down. We let go of it, okay? And it's really important. Serving is really important. Do you know why? Do you know why serving is really important? It's not because God requires it of you. It's not because the church needs you to do it. It's actually for you. It's actually where you're going to find freedom, where you're going to find life, and where you're going to grow. But the thing we need to understand is your flesh is going to hate it. Your flesh is not going to like it. So when you get reactions, when you think nobody's telling me what to do, who do you think that little voice is? Is that Jesus? Or if you say, oh, it's all right, all those guys get to do the important stuff. Nobody notices me cleaning up around here. If you say, I can't help once a month, I am too busy. Do not people not realize what I've got on? Do they sound like the words of Jesus? Because Jesus said, my food is to do your will. Remember when the disciples were worried that he hadn't eaten? But actually, he was being fed when he was doing what the Father asked him to do, when he was serving. When he said, I came to serve, not to be served. I came to be served. Did I say that right? Yes. <laughs> I've written it down wrong in my notes. When he came and he said, I, I lay down my life. And let's look at Paul in Colossians, in that final part of what we've been looking at. It says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Do you know what? We don't have to serve but we get to. Just like we don't have to give, but we get to. Because that's where we're going to find true freedom, true life, when we lay down our lives for the people around us, when we lay down our lives for his church, when we lay down our lives for all those people out there who don't know about him yet. So what's that look like in this place? What does that look like when we come here every week? We want to introduce a new thing with our life groups. And what we want to do is we actually, we want them to be life groups, not kind of just like, well, that's just a nice name, but actually where we find life, where we do life, 
where we discover life. We want them to be a place of love, encouragement, of safety, of joy, of fellowship, a place to serve the body, a place where we belong, a place where we matter and where we're part of something and where we can give something back. We want everyone to be a part of one. We realize that for some people, it's not possible all the time in the week to get to meetings and things. It's not possible just to set aside a night every week and you might never be able to go in the week. But we want to make this church that everyone belongs. Everyone has that sense of belonging, not just corporately as one big group here, but it's like, almost like in the Church of Ireland, Church of England, they have parishes. And even if you don't go to that place, you still belong to that parish. We want you to belong to a life group. We want our life groups to be a place where people connect We want them also to be a place where we serve and where we love and where we encourage each other. So when we come in on a Sunday morning, everyone feels connected to a team. And do you know why that is? Because we are going to find our fulfillment when we are deeply connected with each other. We're going to find our purpose when we are loving and encouraging and when we are being brought together. And what when people walk from the outside, when they walk in, that's when they're going to find this contagious love. And do you know what? It's already happening. I don't know how many people we've had visiting. They all come from America looking for Robin Mark. We're really sorry. He's not here. <laughs> Just, it happens all the time. I think they click on the website. He spoke here once and then that's it. They're all on this journey. But everyone leaves saying, you guys are such a friendly place. You've made us feel so welcome. We really enjoyed being here. You guys are such a family. And the amazing thing for me is over the, we've had lots and lots of people come and go over the years, over 10 years of doing this. And Recently, Andrew and I have had opportunities to speak to people who were here maybe four, five, six, seven years ago. And the one thing that they've all actually said was there was such a sense of community and sense of fellowship and family in this place. And even though they've gone to different places, they've never actually been able to find that again. And I think that's what God has called us to, that contagious love. But it's going to mean us giving up things. Might be sometimes giving up a bit of our pride we don't really feel like doing something, giving up a bit of our time, a bit of our energy. But we are going to get so much more out of it, so much more back from it. The love that we're going to receive back through Jesus is going to way, way, way outload the love that we're going to show and the energy and the time that we're going to give. So I want to encourage you. This morning was really about remembering that Jesus is holding everything together for you. He's the beginning. He's the first one. He's walked the journey for you. He's going to hold and carry you through whatever you face. But He's calling you to connect. He's calling you to a deeper level of relationship with those around you. He's calling you to a deeper sense of purpose. And we're, we're challenging you, Andrew and I are challenging you to think big, to think beyond these walls, to think about that world that you're living in, that light that you are, And to bring those people from that world to a place where they're going to find peace, joy, love, encouragement, hope. Where Jesus, where Christ in you is going to be the hope of glory for those people that you meet. And I think it's time that we all lift our eyes. All lift our eyes and start to believe and start to ask Jesus, put people on our hearts. And I know that Jesus... If you're in a place where you just feel, Jesus, I need that hope again for me. I need to know that hope again. Jesus meets you right where you're at. He meets you right where you're at this morning. And he's going to pour out love and grace. But you know what the amazing thing is? I have found, because over the years, there were so many times I could have thought, I have nothing to give. There was times that I felt very low and felt, but I kept coming here and I kept actually just pouring my life out for other people. And I have found that in doing that, and as much as I give, Jesus keeps filling me and fills more and more. And it's actually often when I begin to minister and pray with others that I'm reminded of how much God has done in me, of how much, how far He has brought me and how much more He has for me. So sometimes we can just think, oh, this is just not my season. And whatever God meets us wherever we're at, but He has so much more, so much more for you, so much more for your family. So let's trust and believe in that this morning. Amen.